This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's episode of Crimes and Consequences. This story is about the Route 40 killer, a.k.a. the Corridor Killer, a.k.a. the Route 13 Killer, (laughs) a.k.a. the Blue Fiber Killer. A.k.a. this fucking asshole. (laughs) All of these monikers represent one man. Huh. Stephen Pinnell. Before I go on to describe this horrible human being. I want to ask everybody to take one second to hit the subscribe slash follow button on whatever app you're listening to. And with that, I am ready. Let's do it. Stephen Pinnell, he has a distinction of being Delaware's only known serial killer. Really? Yeah, that's the only one in Delaware. Delaware is about as big as my backyard. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Thank God they only have one. You might be thinking it's one of the smallest U.S. states, and you'd be correct, but the important thing here is that a major stretch of interstate links Delaware with the nation's capital, and it grants easy access to Philly and Baltimore, so... Oh, yeah, it's like centrally located, right? Exactly. All connected by the freeways. The Route 40 killer is probably the most accurate name for Stephen. The highway enabled his brutal killings, placing vulnerable young women directly in his path. And it also helped him evade authorities in a time when DNA forensics was in its infancy. It's hard to track someone who's on the move and targets victims with few close ties. You know that. I mean, we know that. There's a lot to unpack here, so stick with us as we dive into this twisted tale of murder and mayhem. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a little background on Stephen. Stephen Brian Pinnell. He was the first of two children. He was born on November 22nd in 1957 to his parents, William and Elaine. His early childhood was spent in Wilmington, Delaware. They lived in a two-bedroom apartment located in the Green Hill neighborhood. Don't know where that is. Their block was filled with young couples, with children, so it was a very close-knit community. And Stephen's father worked as a tax accountant at Williamton Trust, so he did a good job. Yeah. His mother was a homemaker until the children were old enough to go to school. Then she worked as a business officer at St. Francis Hospital. So he came from a normal family. Normal family, it seems like. His parents were devout Catholics, and they were really committed to raising their children with strong religious foundations. They attended church regularly, and Stephen was enrolled at Williamton's St. Anthony of Padua, I don't know, (laughs) school for first grade which he failed. He failed first grade? Yep, and he had to be held back. His parents kept him at that school until fourth grade, and then he got transferred to a public school. It was Oak Grove Elementary in Ellesmere. I don't know where that is. Delaware, yeah, I guess, somewhere right? somewhere in Delaware. <laughs> Maybe part of Stephen's difficulty in school had something to do with his family's move. Sometime in 1964, when Stephen was seven, and he had a sister who was about 12 months old, The Pinnells moved to a two-story brick duplex in Ellesmere. Even though it was only 10 minutes from their neighborhood that they'd been in, Stephen had a lot of difficulty making friends and focusing on his schoolwork. He ended up graduating, though, from St. Mark's Catholic High School in 1976. He spent two semesters at the Brandywine College, which doesn't exist, and he studied criminology. Really? Before he dropped out. Friends would later tell the news journal he was determined to be a police officer. Oh my God. Mm Mm-hmm. Crazy. He was a really big guy. He was, I mean, big. He was six foot five, 300 pounds. Damn. Yeah, that's a lot of man. He failed some of the aptitude tests and he was denied entry into the police academy. So there went that dream out the fucking door. (laughs) It's possible this event in Stephen's life was what tipped him over the edge into depravity. Mm. 
After his ambitions were shattered, he worked for a short time as a bouncer at a Williamton nightclub. That's it was probably a good job for him. Yeah, it was called George's Next Door. In 1979, while he was out with friends at a New Jersey bar, he met a lovely lady named Vera. She was divorced with a daughter from a previous marriage, and she was about five years older than Stephen. They quickly formed this friendship, but he still was really immature. In 1980, when Stephen was 23, that's when he had his first brush with the law. He broke into a local tobacco shop to steal a box of coins and some porno magazines. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess he couldn't afford to buy them himself. Ended up pleading guilty to the charges of burglary and criminal mischief. How fucking embarrassing. I know. <laughs> You're in court and it's like, oh, I stole this with some nudie mags, right? I was like, what? Come on. As a first-time offender, he didn't get any jail. And after that, he was determined to turn his life around. Vera and Steven's friendship soon blossomed into a romance, and they began living together in 1981. Before long, they were married. Stephen's parents, they really disapproved of the marriage, mostly because of the age difference and because Vera was divorced. Oh, yeah, that's right. And they were Catholic. Yes. Yes. And there were constant arguments between Vera and Stephen's mother. Oh, great. At one point, there was this vicious spat that resulted in Stephen not talking to his parents for a long time. But for Stephen, Vera was a positive influence. Earlier in their marriage... He enrolled at Delaware Technical Community College, and he was majoring in food service management before switching to electronics. In 1984, he was hired as an apprentice in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Union, but he got expelled, and I don't know why, after eight months. I think you'd have to do something pretty fucked up. Yeah, to get expelled from the union. Yeah. He still managed to get electrical jobs as a contractor, And he worked his way through school. In 1987, he received this Master Limited Electrician's License. Mm. At the time, he was one of 240 people in the state permitted to wire homes. Really? Yes, quite an accomplishment. Electricity is kind of scary. Yeah. Like, my husband will, like, fix things around the house, but he's like, I don't mess with the electricity. Yeah, I (laughs) don't either. And we call an electrician when that happens. And then just like that, he earned respect in his field and lined up his own contract work. He ended up having two sons with Vera. And then they, of course, Stephen had a stepdaughter. And they lived in this mobile home at Glasgow Pines Trailer Court. Neighbors and friends viewed Stephen as a doting father and a loving husband. Oh. They watched him play football and baseball with his boys, and he would give fatherly advice to his teen stepdaughter. He would offer the kids' friends rides to school, and he even played Santa Claus one year at a neighborhood gathering. Damn, where did it all go wrong? I know, that's what we're going to find out. Behind closed doors, Stephen was verbally abusive to his wife and his children. And his treatment to Vera was by far the worst. And, I mean, he was very abusive. At one point, he broke her arm. Really? hmm And that's just one of many injuries she sustained because he would get in these fits of rage. And mostly it would be arguments about their financial instability and their debt that was accumulating. It was hard to keep up the credit card bills with so many mouths to feed. And he had contract work, but it wasn't stable. Did Vera stay home with the kids? I'm guessing. Yeah. Stephen's longest job lasted only a year. And their money problems caused a really, as I said, big strain on their marriage. And it caused Stephen to develop insomnia. Oh, that's a bitch. It is. So when he had this insomnia, he would get in his van and drive around at night. Oh, fuck. And it was only a matter of time before those solo drives took a sinister turn he's got that van and he's creeping got a creepy van like most tradesmen stephen's 1977 ford econoline van was well stocked with various tools and equipment well sure included pliers screwdrivers hammers duct tape wire strips all of which would end up being used to torture his victims son of a bitch 
His first victim was 23-year-old Shirley Ann Ellis, and she was a former sex worker who was now, at well, at that point in the story, attending nursing school. Shirley was last seen alive at around 6 p.m. on November 29th in 1987 as she left her parents' home. She was trying to hitchhike 14 miles to Williamson Hospital, and she encountered Stephen in his blue van. Oh, it was blue. It was blue. <laughs> It was a blue van. Shirley's friend was undergoing AIDS treatment at that hospital, and she wanted to bring him a platter of Thanksgiving leftovers. Oh, that, nice? that is nice. She didn't own her own car, so she often relied on the kindness of strangers while traveling on Route 40 to get where she needed to go. And it was this blind trust that would lead to her undoing. Two hours after Shirley left her parents' house, a young couple was driving around in search of somewhere private. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> they headed south of Newark, New Jersey, and rolled into the old Baltimore Pike Industrial Park. And that's, that's a romantic a, place. <laughs> it, it was a very desolate area. And when they were there, the couple spotted what they first thought was... A mannequin? A mannequin. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. With a closer look, they realized it was a woman's lifeless body, and they immediately called police. Shirley's body had been dumped out in the open. She was naked from the waist down, with her legs spread apart. Her bra had been cut open, exposing her breasts. Officers who arrived at the scene noticed a bloody gash on her head and ligature marks on both her wrists and her ankles. There weren't any ligatures, but there were the marks. Mm. And there was also a piece of black duct tape still stuck in her hair. An autopsy showed Shirley had died from blunt force trauma to the head. And the attack had been barbaric. There were several skull lacerations to the corner. It seemed as if she'd been struck in the head at least three times with a hammer. Oh, fuck. The victim's body showed signs of strangulation and the impression of a tool left an indentation on her stomach. Worst of all, she had severe bruising on her left breast and nipple. Her right nipple had been mutilated with some sharp object. Oddly enough, though, there were no signs of sexual assault. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Even though she didn't have pants on? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But it was obvious that the attacker... His goal was to inflict suffering. It was the torture that he wanted. She had been tortured by work tools and bludgeoned to the point that her face wasn't recognizable. Really? Oh, that's really fucking sad. The only way detectives were able to identify her was through her tattoos. Damn. Yeah, the crime scene was bagged and analyzed, and investigators spoke with all of like Shirley's friends, but there were no leads, and the case went cold. Seven months passed without any incident. It's unclear why Stephen paused after killing Shirley. Maybe he was worried about getting caught. Maybe he was appalled by his actions. I doubt that. I'm just going to say probably not. Probably not. Or maybe he was just looking for the right victim. Maybe he just got busy. (laughs) Maybe he could fall asleep Yeah, I was going to say, maybe he actually got some sleep. 31-year-old Catherine DeMauro had a history of prostitution arrests. It was her only means of income as a divorced mother of two. She was often seen working along Route 40, attracting the attention of the male drivers on their way to the surrounding cities. Catherine was last seen on the night of June 28, 1988, when a motorist dropped her off at her apartment, which was along Route 40. It remains unclear if she was working that night, but her beaten body was found the next day by construction workers building a housing development right off the highway. She was found completely nude, strangled, and bound. Like Shirley Ellis, she suffered from hammer blows to the head. Her body exhibited signs of torture, including a mutilated nipple and deep bruising on her breast. There was important evidence at this crime scene that would prove useful. The victim's body was covered from head to toe in blue carpet fiber, Ah. with trace amounts of red fiber, too. And a piece of black duct tape was also caught in her hair. 
So it's just like the first victim. Mm -hmm. The similarities led investigators to believe this crime and the killing of Shirley were connected. Newcastle County police began working with state police to establish a criminal profile. State investigators reached out to the FBI. I love when they do that. And they (laughs) they reached out to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit for guidance. They told local authorities they might have a serial killer in their midst. Federal agents told them, listen, there's going to be more deaths that are likely to follow if we don't get this guy. And state and county investigators amped up the investigation. They were, like I said, certain this was going to happen again. And they needed to catch this crazy guy before he killed. Newcastle County detectives compared notes on Catherine and Shirley's murders. Neither woman had been raped, as I said, but they both had mutilated breasts. Both victims had hitchhiked regularly along U.S. 13 and U.S. 40, which intersect each other. Okay. Route 40 actually crosses a total of 12 states. I did not know. I didn't know that. Which complicated IDing the killer. But because both victims were found in close proximity, investigators felt confident that the perpetrator lived somewhere in that county, in that area, in the Newcastle County. Like you weren't going to find him, like, in Pennsylvania exactly. or something. Yeah. To dissuade public panic over the killings, additional highway patrol units were added along the route. And police put up bulletins warning women, do not hitchhike. Don't do that. Not here. Dude, it's 1988. Come on. People are still hitchhiking. I'm sorry. It's yeah. so dangerous. I feel so bad every time I hear the story of someone getting picked up. It's I know. just sad. I, I mean, I, I, I Especially, really I would not get, I mean, don't get in the car with a van. Yeah. I mean, don't get in the car with a van, but I'm yeah, saying a, right? Especially a van. a van. They opened this 24-hour tip line. At its peak, it received almost 100 calls a day. Some women continued to hitchhike still, though. Damn it. And two more would pay with their lives. According to a friend, 27-year-old Margaret Finner got into a blue Ford van along South DuPont Highway on August 22nd in 1988. Her body was found months later by hunters. She was near the bank of the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. She was so badly decomposed, though, that they they couldn't even determine the cause of death. On September 10th, 26-year-old Kathleen Meyer left home after her living boyfriend gave her a bloody nose. Oh, what a fucker. So she had to leave. Yeah. God. She disappeared while walking around Route 40, trying to hitch a ride, and her body was never found. Mm. Oh, really? Investigators were unsure if Margaret and Kathleen's deaths were related to the first two murders because, you know, one is just missing Mm -hmm. and the other was too decomposed. But with the mounting public pressure, they decided to go undercover. Several female officers were assigned to act as decoy sex workers that's gotta be terrifying i know and i think i saw this story a long time ago on like forensic files or something it's gotta be so terrifying hell yeah oh i would be sick one rookie cop her name was renee tasher she was 23 years old she made this bold move that would break the case wide open she's posing as a sex worker and this is september 14th in 1988 And she realized a blue Ford van had passed her on the road at least seven times in 20 minutes. Officer Tasher notified backup officers that the van was similar to the one that Margaret Finner disappeared in. The undercover officer moved to a more secluded stretch of the road. Super scary. Yeah, right? And that's when the van pulled over. The driver rolled down his window and he asked the undercover officer if she was, quote unquote, selling. According to the news journal, he introduced himself as Jim and told her he'd just gotten into a fight with his old lady. (laughs) The van's driver kept urging Officer Tasher to get in, but she was stalling. She's like, "Mm -hmm." yeah. She she pretended to be interested in the van, asking if he could turn on a light so she could see how it was decorated. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. She's trying anything, right? She's grasping for straws. Her heart raced when she looked inside. Because there was this blue carpeting all over. And then there were some areas of white and red carpet that, like, the colors of an American flag. Thinking fast, she yanked out a handful of blue carpet 
when uh, the driver's back was turned. So she just grabbed some fibers. Then she made an excuse about being tired, too tired. And yeah. he drove away. I'm not selling tonight. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Officer Tasher later spoke of the interaction to Delaware Today, this paper, remarking, quote, he was different than any other person who stopped for me. It was hard to get into a conversation. He wasn't in the moment. He was looking right through me. That's creepy. Quote. Police followed the van. And they were watching the driver. Of course, it's Steven. And they watched him pick up a different woman. And that's got to be, oh. like, what do you do? Yeah, right. He drove her to a convenience store before dropping her off at the Glen Motel along US 40. The encounter, that passed without incident, at least at that time. Several witnesses would later suggest the woman matched the description of the next victim. In running the van's plates through DMV records, detectives discovered it was registered to Stephen Pinnell and his wife. It marked the first time Stephen's name had come up in the investigation. But that's huge. Right. right? I mean, it's huge. And, of course, the blue carpet fibers that Officer Tasher got they would end up sealing his fate. But I'm going to talk about the third victim. Before I talk about the third victim, we're going to take a quick break. Tragically, just a week after the carpet fibers were sent in for analysis, another young woman was murdered. It was Stephen's youngest victim. Her name was Michelle Gordon, and she was 22. Michelle had a troubled past, She dropped out of high school, and she was arrested several times on drug charges. On September 18th in 1988, she was seen stumbling, drunk, out of a local tavern where a bartender had refused to sell her another drink. At the time, Michelle was living at the DeVille Motel off of Route 40. Mm. By the time her body was discovered, she'd been reported missing by her family for several days. She was found on September 20th, so it's two days later. Washed up on the rocky shores of the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. And I saw pictures of her body, and it's just, it's very, very sad. Unlike the first two victims, Michelle didn't appear to be beaten in the head or strangled. But there was abundance of evidence that she'd been tortured. One of her nipples had been cut off. There were ligature marks. And there was deep bruising on her bottom, similar to the same bruising that they'd seen on Catherine DeMaro's chest, like for some tool. Oh, my God. Some indent. Long knife cuts ran down the back of both of her legs. And, you know, she was alive when this happened. Right. Because he liked to torture. An autopsy found cocaine in her system, making her heart less capable of withstanding the shock of being attacked and the pain inflicted on her. It has been said that Michelle literally was scared to death because the exact cause of death couldn't be determined since her body had been submerged in water. So it had been put in the water, but then it ended up on the shore. And then that sped up the decomposition process. And like I said, I saw a picture and it was horrible, horrible. And she had little marks in her all over Hmm. too from being tortured. The investigation once again intensified with a full-fledged task force reportedly costing the state 35000 a week. I don't know how come they can't get Stephen, but maybe they didn't connect it yet. Federal agents knew they were looking for a white male in his mid-20s to 30s, living within a 10-mile radius where the attacks occurred. This is, you know, what the profile ended up being. And that he worked in some kind of mechanical trade. And that was just based on... I think the torture mechanism, but I'm not sure. The task force established a suspect pool of 100 men known to cruise along routes 13 and 40. Well, that's a list of creepers. I know, I know. That's what I was thinking, too. (laughs) As the potential suspects were questioned, investigators did their best to narrow it down, but it was a big undertaking. And then finally, the test results from the blue carpet fibers were returned. The carpet pulled from the blue van by Officer Tesh matched the ones retrieved from Catherine DeMaro's body. So now they could definitively connect Stephen as their suspect to Catherine's death. Now, a few days later, he was pulled over for a traffic violation 
And patrolmen carted him off to court to settle it right away, which is just so strange. Really? It was a like right then? It was a tactic used to isolate the van Ooh. so the detectives could install a hidden microphone. See, I feel like they could have arrested him at that point for murder, but apparently no. So instead, they installed a hidden microphone. And the mission was a success. They were able to listen for over a month to him in the van. No. But Stephen found the hidden device and ripped it out. But he still wasn't arrested for the murder. What? Maybe they wanted to have like an ironclad case. Yeah. I mean, you can't just I can do, do it on based fibers. on fibers. Yeah. There wasn't anything of interest that they got from the microphone that was installed. So maybe Stephen knew. I don't know. They were all along. I don't know. But there was nothing interesting. Detectives placed him under heavy surveillance, and they followed him everywhere he went, including a rock concert. One day, Stephen stopped at Pep Boys. Oh, yeah, Pep Boys. Yeah, and he bought new tires for the van. A detective spoke to the salesperson and discovered that the van's old tires were thrown in a dumpster outside the store, and they were taken in for analysis. It was soon discovered that these tire tracks matched tire tracks found by Catherine DeMaro's body. So now they're mounting evidence against Stephen. They had enough to get a search warrant for the van and the Pinnell's family's mobile home. On the dashboard of the van was an article about one of the victims. Oh, seriously? Come on, people. Yeah. So he must have been admiring right. the publicity of all these brutal attacks. Under the van's carpet, they recovered stained foam padding, tools, zip ties, mm. and it all ended up linking Stephen to the crimes. Even more incriminating evidence was retrieved from his home. There was a knife, two rolls of duct tape, several pairs of pliers, oh. later found to match the markings on the victim's breasts. Oh, fuck. Handcuffs, and he had violent porn. Oh, yuck. Have you ever pinched yourself with a pair of pliers? No. Like your hand? No. I have. And it hurts. I'm, I have no doubt it would hurt. Oh, God. So now they have enough to arrest him. On November 29th, 1988, a year to the day since he killed his first victim, he was arrested at his house. According to the news journal, when a detective knocked on the door, Stephen said, quote, I guess it's time. What a weird reaction. I guess it's time. You got me. You got me. You finally got me. He was charged with three counts of first-degree murder and held without bail at Gander Hill Prison. Friends were stunned by his arrest. They knew him as this gentle man. Remember, he's playing right. football with his yeah. kids. And they just couldn't believe that he'd be capable of such horrific acts. Poor Vera. But, but that's just it. I mean, it turns out they didn't know him at all. No. The day before the trial was set to begin, several questions were raised about admissibility. And I don't want to get in all that but they were like seizing the carpet was that legal right i thought that when you were telling me like is that a legal capture of evidence and yeah should he be tried separately for each murder should dna fingerprinting be allowed as evidence because that was in the infancy the judge ended up ruling that the fibers were admissible when stephen had opened that van door to invite the officer in to view the carpet then she had every right to it's like plain sight. It's in your plain sight, right? Take a little yeah. bit. She was invited. And he also ruled that there was enough of similarities between three killings that they could be tried together, even though there's more than three. Again, that's all they're trying them for. It might seem confusing to modern true crime fans that the judge would even consider not allowing DNA evidence at a trial. But you have to remember, in 1989, DNA evidence was... Only admissible in 19 states. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. And Delaware was not one of them. Huh. So utilizing DNA analysis at a crime trial was almost unprecedented at the time. Only two other criminal cases in the whole country had permitted its use. Wow, just two. Just two. So the question was, was the judge going to approve DNA evidence? The judge did. He commented to Delaware Today stating, quote, there was a learning curve. There weren't a lot of experts in the field, and there was no case law to ensure the evidence was introduced correctly. I had to let the scientists testify and then make a decision whether their actions were legally sound. And he ultimately decided DNA was admissible, which we all know now that was a good decision. Yeah. <laughs>
The trial began on September 26 in 1989, and it lasted eight weeks. And jurors had to see all these gruesome crime scene photos. And it's hard to describe how horrible the photos are unless you see them, because you're talking about pliers being used to rip off nipples. And just extreme torture with tools. Stephen's alibi for the night of the first murder revolved around his best friend's cat. His cat? Yes. His, yes. This is what his defense brought up. Kenneth W. Sanders said Stephen had come over that day and they stayed in so they could keep an eye on the cat because the cat had been spayed that day. So that's what his friends stood up and said. But the animal hospital record said no. That's the, oh my God, that's it not, wasn't even true. That's not true. The operation was the day before. <laughs> So stupid. He has some stupid friends. Stephen took the stand. Oh, perfect. He basically shot himself in the foot by testifying and tried to explain why the blood and hair of Catherine DeMarle was found in his van. He admitted he picked her up for oral sex and he paid her $25. And that's how, I guess. Blood and hair ended up in his van. Yeah. And then he made a joke that she actually gave me $10 back. Really? Because he's an asshole. (laughs) The jurors were appalled and horrified. The state prosecutor later said, quote, the way he described Catherine was so cold. He talked about her like she was some piece of garbage he could just throw away. I think it hurt him saying that in front of the jury. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I love when they testify on their own behalf. Like what lies they come up with. I know. There's another quote about him testifying. It said, quote, it was a fine piece of testimony, the finest I've ever seen. He explained everything. Where he got slaughtered was his demeanor. He had this cold, dark eyes that didn't move around a lot. I try to work with him, but people are who they are, end quote. And that was from his attorney. Oh. He's trying to polish a turd. Yeah, right. <laughs> when pros- totally. <laughs> right? I tried when- to work with him, so he didn't seem like such a psycho. When prosecutors detailed the torture the women endured... With the aid of the autopsy slides, it was clear that the abuse was meticulous. It was extremely cruel, and it lasted a long time. By the end of the trial, the state felt that they had gone above and beyond to prove he was guilty. A jury panel of seven men and five women deliberated for eight days. Holy shit! The longest in Delaware's legal history. They reviewed all the evidence. Well, they had three cases. Oh, that's true. That's true. And they were divided on Michelle Gordon's case. Jurors struggled to come to consensus, and they were divided on Michelle Gordon's case. They also struggled to come to a consensus about whether to recommend death. Wow, Delaware had the death penalty? Yes. When they hadn't made a decision by Thanksgiving, the judge pressured them, like, you guys need to get a verdict. <laughs> and they- <laughs> It reminds me. Remember we did that trial for your one client, like, years ago, and there was a judge, and he was like, look- we're wrapping it up tomorrow. Yes, yes. I mean, he didn't say it to us. He said it to the other side because they were presenting their case. But the judge is like basically no, like, tomorrow's going to be our last day. We're done. Yeah. Whatever you got to present, the important shit needs to be done by tomorrow. Yeah. So that's basically the judge is like, you guys got to figure this out. Finally, they announced a unanimous guilty verdict on two counts of murder in the cases of Shirley Ellis and Catherine DeMauro. But they were deadlocked on the death penalty, and so he got two life sentences. Mm -hmm. But that's not the end of the story. On February 11th in 1992, he appeared before the Supreme Court. He was representing himself. Like the real Supreme Court? No, I mean, like the the federal? Okay, The the state state Supreme Court. Okay. He pled no contest to the killings of Michelle Gordon and Kathleen Meyer. Then, in another surprise twist, he asked to be sentenced to death. Wow. Yeah. According to the Delaware News Journal, Stephen said in third person, oh, fucking asshole. The perpetrator must have a... <laughs> you know, do people do that, like, to seem more intelligent? Do they do it professional? just... Professional? Yeah, professional. Like, I... <laughs> he is his own attorney. The perpetrator, i.e. me. Right. The perpetrator must have a sense of pleasure in the killings. Oh, well, he would know. Since he did not commit just one, but continued in the same depraved manner on the others, this pleasure is evident. This court has found me guilty on the testimony of witnesses. So I ask that the sentence be death, as said by the state's law and God's law. 
and quit. Ugh. At least he admitted yeah. that he got off on it. Got pleasure in it. Gross. Fucking sick. Prosecutors agreed. Okay, you want death? I mean, we're not yeah. going to fight this. Go for it. But human rights activists and Stephen's wife, Vera, filed a motion to have his sentence commuted. But Stephen still wanted to be executed. And to his relief, the Supreme Court rejected Vera's demands. While on death row, several reporters tried to arrange interviews with Stephen. He refused all but one, during which he revealed nothing new. Big surprise. The prosecutors were still left wondering why Stephen went on this killing spree, and they still didn't know where Catherine Meyer's body was. And they never found out, because on March 14, 1992, Stephen was executed by lethal injection. He was the first person in 46 years wow. to be executed in Delaware. That was pretty quick, too, by the way. Yeah. I mean, he was arrested in 1988. Right. Four years later, he was gone. Wow. It's remarkable the case was solved. It's great. But, I mean, it's bittersweet. The families of Catherine Meyer, Michelle Gordon, and Margaret Finner had to carry on without any real justice for their loved ones. Right. At the same time, this case helped the legal community acknowledge the value of DNA evidence and stopped him from doing killing. It, yeah, doing it again. Yeah. He was nasty. What a he's fuck. like Ugh. he's like your quintessential serial killer in a van with tools, right. murdering sex workers, and torturing, and torturing that he enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, he told the Supreme Court just as much. Yeah, that was exactly what he said. Oh, gross! Yuck! The pleasure is evident. The pleasure is evident. Ugh. So anyway, that is the story of serial killer Stephen Pinnell, aka. 1,000 other monikers <laughs> used for him. Damn. Well, thank you, Talia. Thank you, guys. I hope you guys had a great week. If you guys get a chance, check out our Patreon, and you can see all the other episodes that we have that aren't released to the public, only to our friends. Our special friends. Our special friends. And also, you can get the same thing on Apple if you subscribe to our channel. Plus, you can get stuff like this early and ad-free, which is awesome. Yeah. Who doesn't love an ad free? And I'll put all of our sources on our notes. And I want to thank Allison Schwartz for helping research and write this story. Thank you, Allison. And you can check us out on Facebook if you like and Instagram at Hardcore True Crime. Anything else? If you want to see the photos. Oh, go to our website. Yes. yes. Crimes and consequences. These are not. Yeah. You sickos. You're going to look because I'm going to. That's. Ugh. No, it's bad. I know. Anyway, I want to thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. And until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.